Hello, how are you? Uh, it's just gone nine o'clock here in Port Stewart, Northern Ireland. I hope you're doing well and uh, staying safe, staying home during these extraordinary times we're living through. And um, I'm continuing my evening uh, weekday book readings. So it's time for the, the latest one. Can't believe we're up to chapter 12 of Bread Boy already. Yeah, chapter 12. So I'm going to continue this evening reading from Red Boy, and uh, this is a story. Um, this is a story of uh, the Westie disco trip to London in 1978. My very first trip to London in my life, and also uh, where I fell for a beautiful Italian girl called uh, Maria. So the chapter is called "Oh Maria, This London's a Wonderful Sight." So hope you enjoy this uh, reading from Red Boy. Uh, it's tonight's Belfast lockdown bedtime story. It was the summer of 1978 when I next escaped from Belfast. This trip was to be the most adventurous so far for the members of the Westy Disco. Some benevolent Americans who liked peace had donated money to give us children of the Troubles a holiday away. We were going to London this time and because it was so expensive we had to contribute half the money ourselves. I had been saving most of my bread boy pay and tips for months. Titch had been selling his granny's delft ornaments in Smithfield Market every Saturday afternoon. I think his granny was unaware of this enterprise. Ever since Uncle Henry had announced the forthcoming trip on the way home, home from having fun at the YMCA in Newcastle, I had been dreaming of seeing a real life beef eater. I couldn't wait to see a soldier with a big black furry hat guarding the Queen's house in Buckingham Palace. This latest expedition required only one Saturday away from home and although Leslie was happy to give me the morning off, he couldn't find a satisfactory substitute for me. I gloried in my indispensability. It was the summer of John Travolta and Olivia Newton-John in Greece. John had obviously kept up his dancing after Saturday Night Fever, but Olivia was a revelation. When she sang Summer Nights on the video on top of the pops, she was dead lovely, skipping along and smiling with her lovely hair and dress and all. But when she permed her hair and changed into tight black lycra leggings and high heels for You're the One That I Want, I was genuinely shocked. Up until this point, Olivia Newton-John had been a virgin, like me. Our whole relationship had been built on the unspoken understanding that we were saving ourselves for one another. Olivia had entertained other red-blooded males in her life before now, such as Cliff Richard. But he was a wee good living pop star, so I assumed they had never actually done it. Of course, I was in no position to be judgmental, given my ongoing relationship with Farrah Fawcett Majors up on my bedroom wall in a swimsuit. But I was still in shock when Olivia came on the screen with a fag in her mouth, flirting suggestively in a tight black boob tube at a fairground. This was a long way from the banks of the Ohio. Up to this point, Travolta had been a hero to me. I even defended him when Philip Ferris called him a fruit because he danced. But now Travolta was a love rival. John Travolta was to Olivia Newton-John what Timothy Longsley was to Judy Carlton. In spite of these romantic complications, no one could deny that the music from Greece was brilliant. The tunes took over the Westie disco completely. On some Saturday evenings, there were more songs from Greece than Boney M and ABBA put together. Everyone knew all the words and we sang along as we danced. Some wee girls in our street had been to see Greece 20 times. However, this morning as we gathered at the Nissan hut to wait for the minibus to take us to the Lawrence and Rar Ferry, it became clear that another musical phenomenon had taken hold of the upper shankle. I'll tell you about that in a minute, but I'll say hello to a few people before I do. 
Oh, all the regulars are here. Good to have you. Pete Sapura and um, Evelyn Brown and Kenneth Glenville. Hi, Susan Wilgar. Good evening. Hope you're well. Hi, Norma Fleming. Good to have you along again. The lovely Leslie from up the country is here, of course. And Marty McCauley. Um, you thought of me eating some bread this morning, <laughs> Kenneth. That's great. Hope it was a good sort of farl <laughs> or a wheat, bit of wheaten. Um, hi there, uh, Ali Bennett, another regular. Good to have you. Uh, Evelyn Ian Parsley and uh, hello at Nakamate um, I think from Uganda you're welcome and Anne Riding hello how are you uh, evening Marty hi Francis hi uh, Anne Kirk uh, oh, I like your wee emoji Anne uh, hello, hello Zoe as well with Ali and um, who else is here oh Pat and Mike uh, in New York State hope you're very well over there hope you're keeping safe and well hi Sadie and Alan McLean uh, my old mate from uh, my YMCA days, and Dee Smith and Sadie Hannah listening and watching. Uh, Susan, you love Olivia Newton-John. I still love Olivia Newton-John, I have to be honest. Uh, hey, Dee and Nigel. Uh, you loved Grease, Betty O'Reardon. Well, I, I love Grease too. Um, Karen Shaha, you love Grease too. Lots of, yeah, we're all of a certain age here this evening, I think. Um, oh, Kenneth says, I had the same Farrah Fawcett poster. I came home one day to find my mother had cut the poster off of her shoulders. <laughs> I never found out what happened to her body. <laughs> That's great. I love that. Uh, hello, Andy McCauley. And uh, good evening, Angela and Keith Montgomery as well. And hi, Brendan. So anyway, I've just told you that um, although Grace was the latest big thing, there was another musical phenomenon that was about to hit the West E Disco. We were once again gathering at the church hall around an ever-growing mountain of suitcases and canvas sports bags, some in better shape than others. My big brother boasted a brand new Manchester United bag and Aaron Maxwell had a new purple suitcase with BG stickers. Aaron got quite upset when Titch McCracken threw his old black leather suitcase held together with a snake belt because it didn't close properly on top of her suitcase and dirty Barry Gibbs teeth but everyone else thought it was hilarious. Aaron was so disgruntled, she stopped sharing spangles for the rest of the journey. Heather Mateer had a pink vanity case, which Tit suggested was full of bras and boob tubes. And Sammy Reeves carried a battered old leather suitcase he had borrowed from his granda. Uncle Henry was ticking off the names of everyone who had arrived, and my mother and Auntie Emma were busy reminding us that there was no smoking or drinking allowed at any stage of the trip. My father was across the road at the shop, stocking up on Hamlet cigars for the week. Suddenly, a strange figure strode around the corner in front of us. He had spiky hair, sticking up on end, like when Stan Laurel got electrocuted in a black and white movie. This unfamiliar person was wearing a black leather jacket and a dog collar with studs from a bulldog. He was wearing black Dr. Martens and tight blue jeans with rips at the knees. He wore metal chains around his waist on top of a belt with studs that looked so sharp they could put your eye out. It was a real live punk rocker walking along the West Circular Road and heading in our direction. The whole Westy Disco looked up in astonishment. We were expecting to see loads of punks in London, so this apparition seemed strangely premature. Punk had been going for ages now, and all the proper punks went to the clubs in town and stood outside the city hall between Paisley rallies. But so far, we didn't have very many punks in the upper shankle. As the punk rocker drew near, I noticed he was carrying a small canvas bag. It was covered in the names of punk bands such as The Sex Pistols and The Boomtown Rats and Sham 69. He appeared to be coming in our direction, almost as if he was one of us. Who's that? asked Uncle Henry. It's one of them there punks that spits and all so it is, explained Aaron Maxwell. The punk stopped beside us and threw his bag into the pile of suitcases, strategically striking Barry Gibb between the eyes. He was wearing an earring 
with skull and crossbones, which reminded me of the flag on top of Captain Pugwash's ship. But most shockingly of all, he had a big safety pin, the size of one my mother had used for my wee brother's nappies, pierced right through his nose. Sorry, sir, son, this is the youth club trip to London. You need to have paid your money and all weeks ago, explained Uncle Henry. What? grunted the punk. It was only when he spoke that some vague recognition began to break through. I recognised those surly tones. I knew that face from before it was pierced. I couldn't believe it. Oh my God, says Heather Mateer. Philip Ferris is a fucking punk. Language, Heather, love, said Auntie Emma. The whole Westy disco took a sharp intake of breath. It was true, it really was Philip Ferris. Gone with a duffel coat and the nondescript clothes. What a transformation. I'm surprised his mommy let him go out like that, whispered my mother to Auntie Emma, and her that good living and all. Is Dal not let him play for the BB five-a-side football team if he turns up to a match dressed like that? replied Auntie Emma. All the adults seemed to disapprove, except for my father, who preferred to retain his disapproval for religious and political leaders rather than teenagers. Here we lad, when did you turn punk? asked Hitch. Yeah, right, sneered Philip, with just a hint of an English accent. But why have you gone all punk and all? asked Irene. Anarchy in the UK, answered Philip in an English accent, with a defiant clenched fist in the air. He sounded like that skinhead in the Dick Emery show on a Saturday night. For the next few minutes, as we waited for the minibuses, the whole group gathered in a circle around Philip Ferris the punk, examining his clothes and piercings and bombarding with questions. It emerged that the dog collar had been purchased in the pet shop in Gresham Street, the safety pin had been stolen from his mammy's knitting basket, and the chain had previously been used to prevent the theft of his chopper bike. When we finally board the buses, Philip sat in the back seat on his own, rattling his chains and scratching his inflamed nostril. I couldn't take my eyes off him because it was such a shock. I got up on my knees in my seat and turned round to have another look. Who you looking at? He shouted at me, now with a London accent, not unlike Dick Van Dyke in Mary Poppins. A fair behaviour, I turned around and sat down immediately. Titch McCracken was sitting beside me and had clearly been waiting for an opportunity to share his assessment of Philip's transformation. He looked at me with a sneaky smirk on his face and pointed back towards Philip Ferris with his thumb. Never mind the bollocks, he said. I laughed the whole way to Larn. Titch McCracken may have been a wee tea leaf, but sometimes he could be very funny. I had been dreading the ferry crossing to Stranraer, as my previous trips on the ferry had seen me boke copiously into the Irish Sea. In preparation for the journey, I had declined all smash and fish fingers for 24 hours. On the day of the departure, I had also refused the offer of a packed lunch of corned beef and tomato sandwich, a pack of potato cheese and onion and a bar of caramel. Everyone else was enjoying their packed lunch in the rain on deck, apart from my big brother, Sammy Reeves and several other rebels who were already breaking the no alcohol rule over several harps in the bar below. But I was once again hanging over the edge of the deck contemplating my imminent contribution to the contents of the Irish Sea. At least this time I wasn't wearing my Peter Storm anorak. I, I was wearing my Peter Storm anorak, which could be wiped clean fairly easily should a gust of wind from above the waves decide to blow my boke back on me. I was fully prepared for boomerang boke. I tried to divert myself with thoughts that I was your man, in the white suit from Fantasy Island. And my wee brother was the wee funny man that said, yes, boss, with a lisp. I imagined we were transporting the members of the Westy Disco to a wonderful adventure 
on a tropical island with lovely girls with bikinis and none of this would suppress the nausea. I once again spent most of the trip being sick into the sea and I ventured below decks only once in three hours to find the toilets which smelt of seaweed and pee and made me feel even worse. As I was leaving the gents, I noticed Philip Ferris at the mirror unhooking the safety pin from his mummy's knitting basket from his nose. My nose is fucking killing me, confided Philip desperately. Well, I'm sure you'd be allowed to take your safety, safety pin out for a wee while, Philip, I said sympathetically. Sure, it won't stop you being a proper punk, so it won't. Unfortunately, I was unable to hang around for Philip's reply because a large lorry driver with loyalist tattoos emerged from one of the cubicles. This released yet another foul smell into the air to assault my already overloaded nostrils and I had to run up to the upper deck. When the torturous crossing finally ended, we had to board a coach to take us from Stranraer to London in what must be the longest bike bus ride of my life so far. I'll tell you what happened next in a wee minute. But in the meantime, I'll say hello to uh, everyone who's, who's watching. Um, where did we get to last time? Yes, hi, David Mers, a BRAO boy. And hello, Malcolm Duncan. Hope you're, you're well. And uh, Marlene Williamson from Carn Money. Lovely to have you, Marlene. Good evening. Hello, Alan Sheeran and uh, Alan. I think you may have been at the West D Disco a few times yourself. Hi, Jeremy Skillen. Good to have you, Jeremy. I'm glad you're enjoying it today. <laughs> um, glad you're enjoying it, Neve, as well. Uh, oh, you've got the you've got the book out too. Yeah, what, as I'm as I'm doing it, that's brilliant, Susan. Yeah, lo love the love the wee disco dancing emoji there. And hi, Norma Sloan as well. Good to have you all along. Yeah, so I'll continue the story of how we then actually eventually got to London. I've got to London yet. At the back of the bus. Philip took out his cassette recorder and began playing the Sex Pistols on full volume, complete with the bad language. Irene Maxwell took this as a personal challenge to her authority on all things musical and immediately trebled the volume of her cassette recorder in an attempt to drown out Sid Vicious with David's soul. Thankfully, both sets of batteries ran down around Gretna Green where you ran away to get married if your girlfriend was pregnant or Catholic. The journey was made more interesting by several stops at motorway service stations on the way through England, which revealed unexpected tensions between the people of England and the people of the Upper Shankle. This came as a shock to me because staying British was the most important thing in the world for us. I had always assumed that us being British would be the most important thing in the world for our fellow countrymen and women in England too. The first challenge to our concept of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland was when the woman on the till in the first motorway cafe wouldn't accept a Northern Ireland pound note for my father's sausages and bacon. Sorry, we don't take Irish notes. She announced, that's not very good at English accent, sorry. Look, love, said my father, pointing to the writing on the pound note. It says sterling. It's Northern Ireland note. That's right. We don't take Irish currency here, she replied. Listen, love, it's a sterling note from a British bank in Northern Ireland. You'll have to change it into British pounds at the bank, she said. My father continued to argue for several minutes. When he began to raise his voice in frustration at having his British currency denied on English soil, my mother intervened quickly by providing him with a Bank of England note and pointing out that his sausages and bacon were getting cold. As we ate our meals together, the news of this outrage spread from table to table. They still don't accept our note, says Susan. I know that's I know. I'd give up on that fight long ago. I told you, Eric Love, said my mother. They don't want us over here. Sure, we're nothing but trouble. When we finally arrived in London, we had to remove our luggage from the coach and carry it down extremely long escalators. Then we boarded an exciting underground train in a huge tube 
to take us to Chigwell, where the youth hostel was waiting our arrival. When we arrived at Chigwell station, we shared all, out all our English pound notes so that everyone would have enough money for chips. However, as we ordered our food in the local cafe, I noticed all the English people looking up when they heard our accents. When we claimed a table and piled our luggage up behind it, the other customers kept looking over at our bags with great interest. I couldn't understand why they found our luggage so fascinating. I was beginning to wonder if they didn't sell the latest suitcases in England when my big brother whispered in my ear, Demons all think we're friggin' bombers. I was affronted. How could the English nation get me so wrong? I was the only teenage pacifist in West Belfast. How dare they think I was a terrorist just because of my accent? My bag contained pyjamas and socks and denim aftershave. These English people had nothing to fear from the contents of my luggage. My mustard transistor radio, Doctor Who annual 1977 and Good News Bible were a threat to no one. How could they mistake my innocent and godly goods for Semtex? Everyone was shocked because we'd expected the English to welcome us with open arms for standing up to the IRA. We had assumed English people were on our side, like the soldiers on our streets, but they wouldn't take our money, and when they heard our accents, they assumed we wanted to blow them up. To make matters worse, it was July, but not one of the English houses we passed on the coach journey had put out a Union Jack for the 12th. I was having my eyes open, so I was. For the rest of the week, every time I was in a shop, to avoid further suspicion, I attempted to speak with a London accent, like the cops in the Sweeney. I got a very strange look in a bakery when I asked, Have you any bleeding tidy falls, mate? Of course, Philip Ferris had no problem because punks had to talk with English accents anyway. Thankfully, these shocking revelations about the attitude of our fellow British citizens towards Northern Ireland did not detract from the wonders we were to behold in the days ahead. We travelled around London on the amazing underground railway called the Tube. In Belfast, a tube was a gabshite. Here the Tube was like the Belfast to Bangor train, but faster with more passengers and underground. Above the sliding doors in the underground trains was a big long map with names of all the famous places from the Monopoly board. We took the Tube to see the sights of London every day and soon became experts in travelling around the metropolis. My mother and Auntie Emma were worried we might get lost, but it never happened. Apart from when Sammy Reeves fell asleep and missed his stop the day after sneaking a bottle of gin into the boys' dormitory. Sammy ended up in Wimbledon, but he didn't see any famous tennis players or Wombles collecting litter in the train station. London was nothing like Belfast because it had black people and sex shops instead of bombs and soldiers. It was a huge city with skyscrapers and famous buildings. We visited the Tower of London, which was as big as Long Cash and we saw the crown jewels through very thick glass. I stared at these royal treasures, imagining I was a diamond thief, staking out the joint for the biggest heist in history. But then my mommy grabbed my arm and told me to hurry up because I'd promised to buy my granny a souvenir tea towel. We took pictures of the changing of the guard at Buckingham Palace, and Titch McCracken tried unsuccessfully to make a soldier with a big black furry hat laugh. However, I was disappointed to learn that the Queen wasn't in because she was away on her summer holidays to Balmoral in Scotland. Balmoral must have been like Malisle for the royal family. Then we went to watch a situation comedy called Rings on Their Fingers at the BBC Television Centre beside the Blue Peter Garden. I laughed extra loud, but I couldn't hear myself over the rest of the audience when it came out on the BBC One the following year. 
We saw Big Ben and the Houses of Parliament, where posh people with white hair and very pink faces shouted, Yeah, yeah! My father had written to an English MP, and this gentleman showed us around the ancient stone buildings in a pinstripe suit. My father gave me a good clip round the ear for picking my nose while the posh MP was telling us how Guy Fawkes had invented fireworks and how Westminster was the big mommy of all the parliaments in the whole wild world. As we walked through Soho one evening, I called into one of the news agents in Soho to see if they had the look in summer special in the magazine shelves. I was shocked to find only shelves full of magazines of picture of with pictures of nudie ladies. These magazines look like the bra section in the great universal club book, but without the bras. I exited immediately, as it was probably a sin, but not soon enough to avoid being noticed by my big brother. He felt compelled to point in my direction and shout pervert in front of the whole of the West End of London. As we continued our walk through Soho, we saw all sorts of things you would never see in Belfast. We saw real live homosexuals holding hands and lots of cinemas showing films with nothing but ditties. A black man with dreadlocks asked me if I wanted any hash, but I politely dec declined because I wasn't sure what it was. So say, we'll keep going, say hello to a few more people. Um, hello there, Brian Smith, and uh, hi, Christiane uh, McCauley. Uh, and hi, Amy Nolan in the States, and Norma Sloan, glad you're enjoying it. Hi, Walter Ellis, you're feeling nostalgic, Susan. Karen says, Tony, that's so funny, I always did the English accent while on holiday and thought they wouldn't know it was from Belfast. <laughs> um, your big brother's a major child to you, says Norma Fleming. Oh, yes. Okay, so we'll keep going with our trip to London. Surprisingly, the greatest attraction in London was not to be found on the tourist trail but closer to our temporary home in the youth hostel. We were staying in Chigwell on the outskirts of London, a nice place with swanky houses, cricket fields and pubs with flower boxes at the windows instead of security grills. The youth hostel was located in its own grounds near Epping Forest. I knew it was nowhere near Nottingham, but it was the nearest I'd ever been to an English forest. So I imagined I was Robin Hood in Sherwood, robbing from all the Timothy Longsleys and giving the money to all the Sammy Reeveses. The youth hostel had large dormitories located in rows of two-storey chalets, the same as Butlins in Mosney, but with no chalet maids or redcoats. At the centre of the ground was a football pitch with goal posts where my big brother dazzled the girls every day, playing keepy-uppy, as if he was Geordie Best. I wasn't jealous at all, even though everyone said how brilliant he was and I couldn't kick back doors. There was a toilet and a shower block with a sign saying ablutions above the door. I didn't know what ablutions were, so the first day I couldn't find the toilet and had to pee up a tree at the back of the dormitories. However, once my mother explained the meaning of the word, I did my ablutions there for the rest of the week. The site also included a large indoor hall containing a table tennis table with a broken net and squashed ping pong balls, a snooker table that the boys would never let you have a go on, and a wonderful old-fashioned jukebox with the latest tunes from the top 40. The trusty music machine was in receipt of dozens of 10 pence coins every hour requesting Bee Gees, Grace and Abba. Philip Ferris interrupted the flow of pop and disco music by pressing button, buttons for the odd Boomtown Rats single, which I had to admit I quite enjoyed, even though they were punks from down south, and my father said their scruffy lead singer was a slabber who would be forgotten in a year or two. On the first day in Chigwell, we made an amazing discovery at the back of the youth hostel. Titch and Sammy were looking for a few uncrushed ping-pongs so they could have a go at table tennis when they discovered the storeroom. The door was unlocked so Titch didn't have to break in and when we entered the store I caught a glimpse of something that was so exciting I nearly had to run to the ablutions building. It was a brand new double deck disco unit with two big speakers and built-in coloured spotlights. 
this was an English Westie disco just waiting for us. My father was immediately consulted for his professional DJ assessment of the potential for a disco on Saturday night, just like at home. And he affirmed with all the authority of a great and wise Emperor Roscoe that this would be an excellent disco. It was Heather Mateer who noticed one flaw in the plan. Like, sure with no records with us to play in the bloody thing, so what happened? This was an important observation and we returned to the storeroom in search of 45s. We eventually discovered a small box of records at the back of the store underneath the badminton rackets. But this musical stash consisted of Al Martino's Spanish Eyes, I Am a Cider Drinker by the Wurzels, and three LPs by the James Last and his orchestra that only grannies liked. Here, I have an idea, said Uncle Henry. He was very good at problem solving because he was also a leader in the Scouts. Why don't you all buy singles and LPs with your spending money and bring your favourite song along on Saturday night? I said Aaron Maxwell, I'm buying the Bee Gees anyway. I said Tess McCracken, I'm getting grease from my ma. An okay in the UK, interrupted Philip Ferris with a clenched fist and an inflamed nostril. Uncle Henry looked at Philip with bafflement on his face. Either he wasn't familiar with the concept of anarchy or he was confused by Philip's new English accent. The scene was set and so on our final night in London we were going to have a Chigwell Westy disco. More importantly the disco would be open to everyone staying at the youth hostel. This prospect became very interesting when the Italians arrived on Wednesday night. The Italian teenagers came from Milan at the top of the boot in my geography book, but they didn't speak Latin anymore. I was elated to discover that every single Italian girl was stunning. It was incredible to see with my own eyes that there were no Millies in Milan. The Belfast kids soon got to know our new European neighbours as we congregated around the old jukebox every day. Sammy fancied Fontana with the bum and the big earrings, and Philip had his eye on Isabella with the spiky hair and the black lipstick. Titch McCracken refused to succumb to the charms of the Italian female because he said they were all Catholics and the Pope was their king, so they wanted a united Ireland. My big brother was not interested in the Italian girls either because he had started to go out with Lindsay, a girl in our group who was just as attractive as the Italians, but who was also good at gymnastics. My Italian girl was Maria. So she had the same name as the beauty in West Side Story. Maria was smaller than me and very beautiful with long straight hair, big brown eyes and an irresistible smile with teeth as white as a Bee Gee. I spotted her in the crowd the very first night the Italians arrived in their coach with the steering wheel on the wrong side and a funny number plate. As Uncle Henry and my father were breaking up a scuffle between Titch and two of the Italian boys on this table, I noticed the lovely Maria from a distance she was standing watching these she was standing watching these strange fighting foreigners from ireland speaking english in an unusual accent with several fucks in every sentence it was love at first sight i was still committed to judy carlton and i would never have dreamt of two-timing judy well to be honest i did have regular dreams of two-timing her with wonder woman but that wasn't real life Strictly speaking, Judy had yet to agree to a full romantic relationship and, to be completely honest, she hadn't seemed all that keen on me at the school disco in the dinner hall. So technically, I was young, free and signal, single and so if Maria desired me, I was hers. We have enjoyed several chats about pop music at the jukebox. Maria and I shared a love of Abba and Greece, and I pretended I had heard of some singer she adored called Umberto or something. Whenever I entered the hall or passed her chalet or bumped into her after my ablutions, Maria's perfect smile appeared. 
I'm sure she noticed that she made me smile too. Even though my teeth were more grey than BG White, after they'd been stained by antibiotics when I'd nearly died of pneumonia in 1963. All the boys saw the Chigwell Westy disco on Saturday night as the perfect opportunity for a brief but passionate Italian romance, or at least a chance to try an Italian snog. Kissing an Italian girl from Milan in a disco in London sounded so much more sexy than kissing a wee girl from Milan in an entry up the shankle. We spent our last day with penguins at London Zoo, followed by a marathon shopping expedition in Oxford Street and Regent Street. I bought a shaker maker in Hamley's, the biggest toy shop in the world, which was so different from Leisure World, the biggest toy shop in Belfast, not least because they did not insist on body searches for incendiary devices at the front door. I bought a bar of expensive Mandate soap in one of the posh chemist shops in Oxford Street. And we were, when we got back to the youth hostel, I used my manly soap in my ablutions in preparation for the disco. As the Chigwell Westy disco got underway, Northern Ireland lined up on one side of the hall, while Italy lined up on the other. It was an international interaction, like the World Cup without football, and it's a knockout without giant gorilla suits. As soon as my DJ da put on night fever, all international differences faded away to the throb of a disco beat. The evening was almost ruined when I had to hide in the storeroom behind the folded up table tennis table because Irene Maxwell was seeking me out for a slow dance as Olivia Newton-John sang Hopelessly Devoted to You from Greece. In the end, she gave up pursuing me and bribed Titch with a spangle for a slow dance instead. However, Irene finally moved on to Fabio, a skinny Italian who was only 13 and wore sunglasses indoors, even though he clearly wasn't in the UDA. I assumed Fabio's darkened vision had contributed to his decision to accept a dance with Irene. Or maybe they didn't have spangles in Italy and the temptation was overwhelming. Bella, bella! said Fabio as he danced with Irene Maxwell. As Irene rubbed up close to Fabio, she kept looking over at me with a see what you're missing, wee lad, look on her face. I pretended not to notice, just in case Fabio's da was in the mafia. Another notable moment was Fontana asking Sammy Reeves to dance. She snogged him with her tongue throughout How Deep Is Your Love. No Belfast girl had ever shown any sexual interest in Sammy Reeves before this because of his personal hygiene issues. My big brother explained that Fontana must have eaten so much garlic in her Italian food that she didn't notice the whiff. As for me, I grasped my opportunity with Maria when Dad put on Take a Chance on Me. The day before, I'd given Maria 10p to play this song on the jukebox because she said it was her favourite ABBA single. As soon as Benny and Bjorn started up there, take a chance, take a chance, take a, take a chance, chance, at the start of the song, I made my way across the dance floor towards the beauty of Milan. As if, it was as if the super Swedes were speaking directly to me. Do you want to take a chance on me? I asked Maria pointing to the dance floor. It's a my favourite, she replied with that hypnotising smile. You're my favourite, so you are. Oh, Antonio, she laughed and stood up, took my hand, and we walked together onto the dance floor. My mother and Auntie Emma whispered and smiled behind the tuck shop, and my big brother looked on in disbelief at the idea that any girl so beautiful would be interested in me. Titch McCracken had warned everyone not to snog any Italian Catholics or we would be supporting the IRA, but his remonstrations had fallen on deaf ears and so he scowled and stomped out of the hall. When the slow dances came, I held my Italian beauty very close to my body. She rested her cheek so close to my cheek that I could smell the wrigglies on her breath.
and harmony hairspray in her hair. When the final song was announced, we kissed, and it was a proper kiss, like Big Ruby had taught me in the sand dunes in Malai. I put my fingers through my Maria's hair because that meant I loved her, and she smiled and kissed me some more. When Maria and I parted that night, we swapped addresses and promised to write. But deep down, I knew I would never see her again. I could never afford to go to Italy, and no one would want to come to Belfast. I did have some pangs of guilt about betraying Judy back in Belfast. I remembered that Torn Between Two Lovers song on top of the pops. When I arrived back in the boys' dormitory, the situation was deteriorating rapidly due to the two bottles of vodka that Sammy had smuggled into the youth hostel in his Hamley's bag. I refused the offers of drink because I was still intoxicated by Maria and I was too good living to get drunk. When half the boys' dormitory decided to do a streak around the football pitch, I also declined to participate because it was probably a sin and more importantly, I was afraid Maria might peek out her window and maybe be disappointed with my Jimmy Joe. I wrote to Maria for years afterwards and she wrote back and I worried about her every time there was an earthquake in Italy. I was afraid she might get buried alive under the ash like in Pompeii. I was all grown up and nearly shaven now. I had kissed a real live beautiful Italian girl and she had kissed me back. I was becoming a man. So I was. So there you are. That's chapter 12 of Bread Boy. Oh, that was a great summer. I remember it all so well. Uh, so let's say hello. Who else is, who else is here? Um, glad you're enjoying it. Um, hi, Norma and Michael McKinley Sr., another regular. Um, Susan, Susan says, my bookmark is signed. Paperboy ticket, August 2019. Oh, right, you were at the show, at the musical. Whoa, Tony, oh, yes. I was doing well there, wasn't it, Norma? Uh, I have to go back to the start. Yeah, yeah, you've missed the start, Michael, so you can catch up later. Hello, Gillian and uh, Yitzhak. Hi, Evelyn. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Glad you enjoyed it, Susan. And also, Nigel McClum says that was fan flipping -tastic. Thank you very much. Appreciate that feedback. Thanks for joining me. I'll be back tomorrow night again with the next chapter of Bread Boy. So until then, um, stay home, stay well, and stay positive.